Welcome to another episode of The Short of It. I'm Carson Block of Zeros TV and Muddy Waters Capital. I'm joined by my Muddy Waters colleague, Freddie Brick, and also Whitney Tilson of Empire Financial Research. Empire Financial Research is a very successful investment newsletter, and before Whitney started that, he ran long short equities for about 20 years uh, and was part of or, even, or witness to some of the largest battles between longs and shorts uh, that have occurred in, since, the, since 2000. So thanks for joining us, Whitney. It's your job to be here, but thank you anyway. And uh, yeah, I, I wanna get started, Whitney, by asking you a question um, about the markets and really ties in with fund management. Um, you know, fund management in long short equity is obviously hard. It's been very hard with the short book in the past couple, well, past decade and change since the financial crisis. We are entering in a new paradigm here, and I, I think it's too early to say what that is, but it seems that we're at a bookend now to what started really right after Lehman failed. It's funny because we know so many people who've gone out of business who are running short books or short dedicated strategies. And those strategies were normally, I mean, the idea if you were running a large short book or you were short biased, the idea is that you're providing insurance for large allocators who are along the world, and they just got tired of losing money year after year after year, starting in 2009. But I kind of wonder now, and with hardly any short sellers still breathing, I kind of wonder if now is actually a good time to launch a product or to have a real short book um, because we are going to some new paradigm. And curious as to what your thoughts are and if you're ready to walk away from Empire Financial and, and start running short money again. Right. Uh, no, I'm, I, I love what I do with uh, Empire, and so no plans to leave. Um, interestingly, we do, we've thought about creating a short focus newsletter, um, and our audience is mostly retail, not professional Wall Street types, not hedge fund types. Um, and so we haven't launched it yet because we're not sure there's a market out there for retail folks. And frankly, it's probably not a good idea for you know, your average Joe, like our, our typical subscriber is the Ford dealer in Macon, Georgia, who doesn't trust Wall Street, wants to manage his own monies, saved a couple million dollars, wants to invest most of it in conservative blue chip stocks, but then maybe a little bit of crypto over here, some high growth stocks over there, you know, with one or 2% of the portfolio, and they're not really looking to short. And that's probably a good idea. Um, shorting, as we all know, is just a brutal business. Um, it's gotten, uh, I'd say, a little better. Um, you've pointed out, so about since March 10th of 09, <laughs> the 10, 12 years, the first 10 or 12 years of my hedge fund, that was a great time for long short in general, for shorting, it was sort of a rational world. And then ever since, the, you know, the massive injections of liquidity, um, the genuine economic recovery from you know, the economy sort of being on death's door um, uh, during the global financial crisis. And then you know, I, I'd actually argue the past couple of years, as some folks, uh, you know, Melvin Capital learned the hard way a little over a year ago, the whole meme stock phenomenon and the retail investors squeezing the shorts and all has introduced a, a sort of a new, almost existential threat. To, to shorting. So look, the absolute best time to short in my investing lifetime was 13 months ago or so when the meme stock bubble peaked at end of January last year and then the ultra high growth stock bubble peaked uh, just a couple weeks later. If you look at Kathy Wood's ARK Invest, uh, ARKK, it peaked on February 12th of last year. It's down 60% since then. And that's been, you know, given that a lot of short sellers were either short ARKK directly as a proxy or a lot of those component stocks, um, you know, there's been a pretty nice tailwind. Long shorts started to work. Um, if you look at Berkshire Hathaway as a proxy for value, ARKK as a proxy for growth, um, since February 12th of last year when ARK peaked, it's down 60 and Berkshire's up 40. Uh, so that's 100 points of outperformance for a typical long short value guy like me. But the prior 12 years were brutal. Right, and then that actually, something you said there is also really interesting because it implies that at least right now and perhaps going forward, there's gonna be a correlation in terms of performance between value managers and short sellers. I, I don't think that's always been the case, but do you think that's maybe a fair 
uh, fair assumption um, at this moment in time? Yeah, well, I, I think there is a correlation. If you look at long short managers, um, they, the ones who are drawn to the short side tend to be sort of the skeptics. Uh, they're uh, wary of overvalued junk, which means they tend to like undervalued stuff, right? Um, uh, but as we learned um, the hard way, uh, we sort of long short value guys is, is having a portfolio of long Berkshire Hathaways and short Teslas or Netflixes or Squares or Shopify's um, or Roku's or whatever. You know, the famous saying is, is the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. And that dynamic uh, really that persisted for more than a decade coming out of the global financial crisis uh, was brutal. So uh, I, I think if I were to get back into shorting, I think your business model, finding individual companies um, and uh, you know, putting together great research um, and then uh, you know, almost like a, a more shorter term um, individual stock focused um, uh, approach makes more sense than what I was doing, which is had a basket of you know 51 percent positions offsetting 100 percent long exposure um, you know just being short 51 percent positions it certainly wasn't working for me I, i'm not sure i'm seeing who it's working for uh, over the past 12 years or so um, and i'm so i hesitate to say that's completely dead it's it's worked pretty well for the past 13 14 months because all those growth stocks that Kathy Woods owns were pro probably the part of those 1% positions. It's, uh, it's, it's hard. That's a hard business model. A any kind of shorting is a hard business model, but 51% positions, I think, is particularly hard. So talking about that model, it's, it's interesting because you ran what classically is a way to not go out of business. Short book, lots of small positions, but you actually were pretty prominently involved in a couple of really... Sure. Interesting activist cases, um, lumber liquidators, I remember well, and, and others before that. So how were you able to balance your time doing the really in-depth, you have to be right, you're going to be out there publicly. The level of scrutiny on that is much, much higher than work you might be doing privately on short. So how were you able to balance time and resources to do that? and? How many of your shorts were these really high conviction shorts versus, ah, okay, look at that, the management seems scummy, the whole industry is a disaster. How were you managing that? Yeah, um, not very well. And honestly, <laughs> that's why I, um, one of the reasons why I, um, I underperformed, I didn't lose my investors' money, but I just didn't make them very much money during the long bull market of the past 10 years. Um, and when I look back, I think um, you're running a 50 stock short book with an occasional high profile short that I would really size up and make it 3% or 4%, right? Um, but spend enormous amounts of time. For example, the whole lumber liquidator saga where I was on 60 Minutes, et cetera, you know, played out over a couple of years. One of the first people to raise questions about lumber liquidators back in 2013 was Whitney Tilson, a Wall Street hedge fund manager. He has shorted the company's stock, but is not involved in any lawsuits against it. In 16 years of professional money management, I've seen hundreds of companies do all sorts of bad things uh, to get their stock prices up. Um, but this has got to be the worst. Six months after he bet millions the stock would go down, Whitney Tilson got tipped off by someone familiar with lumber liquidators' operations in China, who said he was missing the bigger story. The much bigger story, he said, is, is that lumber liquidators was almost certainly uh, purchasing formaldehyde tainted um, laminated flooring uh, in China. Why would lumber liquidators purchase wood that's tainted with formaldehyde? The answer is, is greed, plain and simple. It's cheaper and net-net it reduces the cost by about 10 percent. Which in a business with these kind of profit margins, 10 percent means a it's lot of money. It's enormous. Where it was an enormous time suck and I made good money on that short. You know, the company, the stock went from over 120 to 10 or something. Um, and I played that pretty well. And as the 60 Minutes piece aired and the stock really started to collapse, I added to my short position, you know, on the, from the mid-30s, you know, all the way down and covered it pretty well. But, you know, shorting, uh, I didn't make nearly as much money as if I'd simply bought Google or Facebook or Apple and held it 
for the same two years when I could have put a 10% position on safely in a big cap blue chip versus all this effort for something you can't really size shorts that big because of the sort of the just the volatility risk. Uh, you know, they can, uh, they can double against you and you're forced to cover. Uh, so you have to, whereas on the, you know, on the long side, if I own something I really like and it goes down by 50%, I'm not, my, my business isn't in jeopardy and I can, I can wait it out. You make an interesting point and that's one of the things that I think a lot of people don't understand about traditional short selling or non-activist short selling is that the people who stayed in business have tiny positions. The way that Kinecos at least used to run they would have 70 to 80 names in the book. And when you think about what the top of the funnel must look like to get down to 70 to 80, you're talking hundreds right. that they probably research. And that brings up this issue of scale. To get from this, or to even get this at the top of the funnel, although I think Jim and his partners probably, which is a bit unusual, are responsible for the idea gen at the top of the funnel. But to get from there down there, you need a lot of analysts, which means you need a lot of AUM and an environment that we've had the past uh, decade where allocators just decided they were tired of losing money on short books, that's been very hard. Since I've been in this business 12 years, every now and then I've seen somebody launch or think about launching a short only fund or short oriented fund, and they'll say, yeah, you know, we wanna be really concentrated. We wanna have, say, 20 names in the book that are about 5% positions, and." we're just gonna know these names better than everybody else, and they're really high conviction names. Did you see fund managers like that pre-financial crisis um, on the short side who thought that if you just research names really well, you could have these chunkier positions, and did it not usually work out well for them, even pre-GFC? Yeah, there were, I mean, there historically, I don't think there have been that many short-only funds, um, Chanos and Kinecos being one of the only ones but uh, that I'm more familiar with. But even in that case, my understanding is, is with at least his own capital or one of his funds, I think he may have had multiple funds, where he would be 200% long the S&P 500 index and then 100% short well-targeted a basket of his short ideas. And that actually performed pretty well during a bull market because you know, his basket sort of tracked the market is my understanding, but his 2X levered uh, long book doubled the market. And so net net, he did super well. That was until I read an article about that, it, it, I couldn't understand how he had stayed in business all these years during mostly bull market times. I don't think I, I would run from any manager who came pitching me 25% short positions uh, because the problem is, is, is as with any portfolio management, um, it's the tails that drive the ultimate returns. On the long side, if you have a 20 stock long book, I promise you if you hold it for any period of time, two to three stocks, 10 to 15%, are gonna wildly outperform your expectations. And the key is you gotta hold them. You wanna know why index funds beat virtually all active managers over time? Think about the S&P 500 index. They went long Tesla uh, 50 bagger ago and have never sold a share. They went long Amazon 100 bagger ago, have never sold a share. They went long Apple a 500 bagger ago, never sold a share. And I don't know any active managers who have the kind of discipline you know, to just hold their winners and let them run. And so I've gone back and looked at my portfolio on January 1st of 2013. I owned uh, when I, I had been in a business partnership, we were co-managing the fund and that didn't work. So I separated, I went to cash and it was basically a relaunch 14 years into my career. And it kills me to look back and I owned a 5% position in Netflix, a 5% position in Apple, and then a bunch of other value stocks. I own Citigroup, I own Goldman, I own Berkshire, and I own some junky stuff that went to zero. But none of it mattered except I owned Two of my 12 stocks were moonshots, you know, Netflix a 50 bagger and Apple a 10 bagger, and nothing else mattered if I just held them. And I also, by the way, had a 12 stock short book, and it performed sort of in line with the market, but I had a, a 1.5% short position in Tesla. I, you know, Tesla came very close, like within yep. days of going bankrupt right. back which, in the day. Which right? Elon admitted after the fact. Exactly, and that was the, the theory was he was going to be forced to sell to Google, and the stock 
pre-split was at 30 and Google was going to pay 75 or something, so I had failed to consider that. It would have been bad short anyway, but I wish that had happened. I wish I had only lost double my money, <laughs> right? But the point is, is uh, um, both my short book and my long book were um, the ultimate returns had I just done nothing and gone on vacation for five years. One, I would have done great even with my short book, um, even with a 1.2% position Tesla, you know, going up 10x over that period. Secondly, um, you know, on the, on the long side, you can, you can just go away for five years. On the short side, you can't, and so that's the problem. A 5% short position, and you're wrong on one of 10 or one of 20 positions, um, it's deadly. It means you've got to use stop losses. It's more trading-oriented. Um, I don't see how that works. And there's, there's a lot of hostility out there to hedge funds, but also to short sellers. You know, I generally believe short sellers don't wear the black hats. They wear the white hats. They're the good guys policing the market um, in a way that the regulators just don't have the resources to do. My, and I'm sure your experience is similar, uh, you could tell war stories as well. Um, yeah, you can go tell the SEC about a blindingly obvious fraud, and they're busy, and they blow you off, and they're like, oh, you're just trying to get us to make the stock, and take actions that'll make the stock go down, right? There's sort of skepticism, I think. Getting back to your question about, you know, why should you go public and not just take it to the SEC quietly is, is is because it doesn't work. You need the markets to understand and to react. And often by going public, I found in my case, you know, I went public not as often. It wasn't really the core of my business, but I'd say every couple of years something would come along. Um, a company called K12 um, that did uh, as a for-profit charter school operator, you know, for over a year. Um, uh, I published quite a bit on them. I found that getting other investors involved, um, the media looking into companies and all, um, I was a very small operation. And even a big operation in the short side might, you know, Jim Chanos is, might be the biggest. You know, he's just got a half dozen analysts. I don't even know. But that's still nothing um, related uh, relative to the collective power of lots of other investors and media. And then the regulators, too, can look into it and, and sort of collectively you know, when you're talking about big companies here, you, you sort of need a, a crowd effort to identify what's wrong and, and make the company um, fix it. And, and I also think that it's, there is something, in terms of whether regulators look at a company, um, directors and officers or auditors resign, I feel like there is a relationship between the initial reception of the market or the impact. So if the stock if somebody voices a negative view on a stock and lays out a bunch of issues with it, then particularly if it involves unethical conduct, illegal conduct, if the stock doesn't react that day, I think everybody, at least today's, today's day and age, everybody on the inside of the company breathes a sigh of relief. Outside investors, I think, no longer care. Um, they're no longer gonna really look to dig into the risk to see if there's a problem there and the show goes on and probably nothing really happens. But if there's a reaction, then investors are upset, then board members get uncomfortable, auditors maybe start to think that, they come, that they're not gonna stand by while the company uh, issues accounts that are so aggressive. So I think there is, there is also an important, in terms of getting regulators to take action, look at a company and maybe take action on it. I think there's an important element there if you're going public and you can create this, this highly, this, this scrutiny on the company. And without that, I think it's far less likely because yeah, probably the SEC is drowning in these TCR forms for all these different kinds of scams, whether they're public or private. Yeah, the other comment I'll, I'll make on that is, is it almost just astounds me to this day at how long it takes for the market to wake up. You know, I can read some of your reports and instantly tell, like go to the famous, uh, you know, Chinese uh, for-profit education company, you, you know. <laughs> well, with the real yeah. for-profit, but the real business was being public, not actually educating people. Yes, um, um, or uh, Gabriel Grego on uh, Cassava Sciences, um, where the stock he published on, it must have been, I don't know, six or eight months ago, and the stock I just checked is exactly at $42, where it was when he published on it, and um, in both cases, just laying out an airtight case that now afterward you can tell you know the companies always respond and they 
And, and you can, I always read the responses carefully. Maybe the, the short seller got it wrong, right? Uh, and I have seen some funny cases, you know, back in the day. Um, I always look to see how companies react because that can tell you if, uh, if a company sort of lawyers up and threatens you and says, we're going to sue you and we're going to complain to the regulators and all, you know they're guilty. If, on the other hand, I can give, think of a couple examples where you should worry. Um, one was uh, Kinder Morgan, uh, the oil pipeline company is a master limited partnership and all, and, uh, and some short sellers came after it. Kinder Morgan on its next conference call had the 10 things the shorts got wrong. And it was actually pretty funny. And one of them, I remember one of the bullets, was, which was Mike Morgan and Rich Morgan are two different people. <laughs> um, you know, because there was a father and a son in the business, and the short seller hadn't even figured out that they were two different executives in the company. And I was like, ooh, you know, maybe this, I don't even remember who the short was on it, but it, it really undermined their credibility. So the company is just like, look, we don't care. He can say whatever he wants. Here are the 10 reasons. Here are the 10 things he got wrong. Um, but the other case I can think of was very personal. Um, I was short Netflix back when they first started rolling out streaming, and I, I thought that would, wasn't going to be a good business, and all these new competitors would emerge. I had it completely wrong. So meanwhile, the stock was ripping upward. It was very frustrating. So I decided to publish an 18-page report on why we're short Netflix. You can Google it. Google Whitney Tilson, why we're short Netflix. I, rem I mean, and, I remember you being and, short and yeah. then changing your mind. And, um, and then um, a day after, or two days after I published it, Reed Hastings, who we had, he knew who I was and knew like I wasn't a bad guy. Um, uh, you know, we just had a difference of opinion and all. He was on the board of KIPP Charter Schools nationally and I was on the board of KIPP Charter Schools in, here in New York, still am. We had met each other at a KIPP conference or whatever. So he knew I was sort of a philanthropic guy and he's a philanthropic guy and had served in the Peace Corps and my parents were in the Peace Corps. So, so it, that maybe because of that personal connection, there wasn't the instant hostility. But he wrote, and again, you can Google Reed Hastings, Whitney Tilson, the title of the article is Whitney Tilson, cover your Netflix short now. And he laid out and he acknowledged, you know, the valuation may be stretched, but I don't think you're fully appreciating what a good business this streaming business is. Um, and he laid out the argument. And he said, he invited me to come sit with him. And a month later, I flew out to California on a Sunday. We uh, sat down at brunch. And you know, he showed up in flip-flops and shorts, and it was a sunny California day. And we just shot the shit for an hour or two about life, about the business and all. And as I took the taxi back to the airport, I'm like, I'm covering my Netflix short tomorrow. I do not want to be short anything this guy is running, because he was that impressive. But he, uh, just as a, as a leader, uh, as a CEO, but also he laid out a bunch of things I didn't fully appreciate uh, about the streaming business. And at that point, I didn't go long it, but because the stock had at that point, I, this is pre a seven for one split, but I had shorted it from 80 to 180. I got out at 200, I covered. The stock then went to 300 a few months later. And I was like, phew, thank you, Reed, for getting me out of that short. Then the stock went from 300 to 75 uh, with the whole Quickster debacle. And I sent Reed a note. And he emailed me back and said, and I still remember the exact words, because you don't hear this from CEOs very often. He said, Whitney, it turns out you got everything in your short report right, except management shooting itself in the foot. And so he was acknowledging this quickster debacle. Um, you may recall uh, for your viewers uh, that he tried to separate out the DVD by mail business, which was a, a declining cash cow. Um, from their high growth business, their streaming business. And the obvious strategy for any CEO, you know, business school 101 is, is you milk your cash cow, you take the cash flows, and you reinvest them in the growth business that creates all this value. And his idea was to separate the two businesses so that couldn't take place. And I said, what are you doing? That's crazy. And that's what I emailed him. And he acknowledged his mistake, said he shot himself in the foot, but that made me realize, okay, he's going to fix it. And so that's when I went long Netflix. Um, split adjusted, that was at under $10 a share. So the stock since that point has been you know, one of the best performing in stock market history. Um, and I went long it. And my only regret is, is that this was back when I was getting too stupid with my portfolio management. I wasn't letting my winners run. You know, it doubled and I sold half. It doubled, I sold half, doubled again, and I sold it and got out. You know, biggest investment mistake in my career was, you know, uh, was this, this would be one example of probably a half dozen 
where I owned, I correctly identified some of the greatest businesses of all time and then very foolishly, you know, got dumb one day and, you know, made some money but sold them ultimately. And all I had to do was just hang on to them. Well, one thing that's really interesting about that story and relating to the, the broader environment for activist short selling, you weren't making any accusations of unethical conduct no. or misleading accounting or disclosures. And I think that, because obviously if you were, you probably weren't going to have that dialogue, yes. at least in such a casual way and without lawyers and a court stenographer around. So I think that's one of the, that, that's one of the things people also don't understand is when we think about activist short selling, most of it, at least I would say, isn't really based on fundamental issues or you know, valuation relative to fundamental issues. It's really based on these things actually, the, the way that these things happen are different from how the company presents it. They're also not telling you this. And, and it can get very uh, adversarial, um, in which case yeah, you wouldn't be invited to hang out and have brunch. Yes. Um, and that confusion is also when talking about the, the DOJ investigation, you know, it appears as though there's, there was some academic research done back in 2018 where a professor said, okay, I've studied 1,720 short attacks right. on companies in the mid cap and large cap space, which you know, was really at the time when we became aware of this paper first in 2019 was really surprising to us because there are very few short activists who swing a bat in the mid cap space. I mean, we're one of, you know, over this eight year span, maybe four or five. Uh, so there's no way we could have gotten to 1720. And so I think what you're talking about there and that, and that's, that's actual short research and it's a short thesis, but I think that is separate from short activism and you know, wouldn't, you know, the, the, I could not see a scenario in which what you did there could give rise to real liability or concerns about that. I think though the, so look, if you go after a company, you say it's a total fraud or these guys are crooks or something like that. Or, or just like the, the yeah. financials are heavily manipulated. I mean, a lot yeah. of the manipulation is technically legal or it's in a gray right. area. Yes, the other thing I, I will underscore is, is one of the things I've learned is, is just don't short something where the customers love the product. I mean, I can think, you know, Netflix, Green Mountain Coffee ended up, I mean, they were actually cooking their books and we still lost money on that right. because people they were required. People love yeah. the products, right? Um, and well, and another Uber? example would be Tesla, right at the what top. About Uber though, because yeah, I love but, the product. You could argue, that still it, appears to be a but a lot of business. people hate the product too, right? Uh, yeah, taxi drivers until yeah. they allowed New York taxi drivers on the app, which now means it's actually a taxi business. Well, are they yeah. are the haters haters because they feel like there's something immoral about it? I mean, they hate it for social yeah, virtue signaling reasons. I mean, look, I've been reasons. super bearish on Uber, um, mm -hmm. but one of the I think to the point is is it. Depending on if you were very clever, maybe you made a little money on the short, but that stock uh, has not gone down the way I expected it to. But it's um, underperformed in a basket of tech or cues or anything. Yeah. I, feel like I, I mean, if you would ask me a business that would be, that would, uh, they had some debt and so forth that would go to zero in the pandemic, I would have put Uber pretty close to the top of the list, mm -hmm. yet, you know, they pivoted to Uber Eats and, uh, and, it is, a, it is a great service. So this will sound like a question from somebody who does very little long side investing. But when I look at Uber and Netflix, I see two businesses that sell a dollar for well less than a dollar. Customers might like Netflix a little bit more, although if you use Uber, presumably you like it. Why is Uber a better short or Netflix a better long if you still have this same underlying economic dynamic which is selling a dollar for less than a dollar. Yeah, um, I guess I would argue that Uber, um, its core, tr I, I don't know much about Uber Eats, although it strikes me all uh, both of Uber's core businesses, the transportation and the Eats part, are inherently unprofitable. Um, and so that's why I've been bearish on Uber. Um, uh, you know, I no longer run a fund, so I can't say I'm short Uber. I don't know, I'd have to think about whether uh, I would want to short it. Um, because I, I don't think there's anything fraudulent there. I think the folks running it are very smart, and mm -hmm. it's, it's hard being short, innovative, smart people. 
Um, one of the reasons I actually did cover my Tesla short um, back after, you know, again, this is pre a five for one split, but I shorted it from like 30 to 200 or something like that. Um, and, uh, and it's been a 10 bagger since then. Uh, so thank goodness I got out. But my cousin put me in touch, uh, my cousin uh, with a couple engineers there. My cousin was a top notch uh, mechanical engineer from Stanford and he ran the Stanford solar car project. So he was totally plugged in to the whole EV world. And he said, oh, two of the guys who worked with me on the Stanford solar car project work for Tesla. You want to talk to them? And I said, sure, I talked to these guys. They helped me understand that Tesla was just a magnet for the smartest auto uh, in electric and solar guys, they're virtually all guys, in the world. There was only one place in the world that they wanted to work, and that was Tesla. And they were all working 20 hours a day, because Elon Musk was out there working 22 hours a day. Um, and, they, and they worshipped him, like he was a real engineer. Now everybody, the, the short case on Tesla, a lot of the shorts I was like, Elon Musk is a phony and a fraud. And I sort of maybe bought into that because he's such a loose cannon on Twitter and just sort of an odd guy, right? And talking to these engineers made me realize, okay, these, are, these guys are the real deal. Tesla is filled with guys just like this and they will run through brick walls for Elon Musk. And I said, holy cow, I do not want to be short this. I don't think the same is true of Uber, but I think it's legitimate company, well-funded, and they've got a lot of smart people there trying to do innovative things. But I think they're just inherently in a brutally tough probably structurally unprofitable business. Netflix, on the other hand, I think is an incredible business. So your question asserted that it's structurally unprofitable, same as Uber, and I actually disagree with that. Basically, Netflix's strategy, and, and Reed Hastings laid this out for me the better part of a decade ago, where he basically said, we take, uh, every customer pays us at that time, I don't know, it was $8 or maybe $10 a month times 30 million subscribers at the time, you know, a couple hundred million now, whatever the number is. And that's just pure cash that's coming in every month. And then we turn around and reinvest two thirds of it in new content and use the other third to cover our costs. So we, we deliberately structure ourselves as a super high growth moonshot is to not be profitable, to be a break even business in which we just take the majority of the money coming in um, uh, and plow it back into basically growth, in this case, mostly by investing in new content. And sure enough, this company's been able to maintain a 40% revenue growth rate for the better part of 10 years. I mean, how do you, how do you, get, what's the, how do you get a 50 to 70 bagger in an eight year time period, which is what Netflix was? And the answer is, is get a 10 bagger on your revenue and then it was trading at one times revenue and it went up to trading at seven times revenue and boom, you multiply those things together and that's a 70 bagger, right? So your follow-up question is, yeah, but Whitney, how is that structurally, and that doesn't mean the business is profitable, it just means it grew a lot, right? Well, it's actually, I was gonna ask, so mm -hmm. if we move toward a paradigm where you have meaningfully positive real rates, right. you don't get an 80 bagger and is the company, you know, are these, any, these companies that are selling dollars for 50 cents, right? Are they, do they no longer work? And then the corollary to that, if we're comparing Uber to Netflix is, Uber's got really one other competitor out there, Lyft. I mean, Netflix, you know, it's one of the things that I hear more and more from people. Yes. And it mirrors my own feelings. It's just like almost a fury that I have to buy all these <laughs> subscription packages yes. to watch what I want to watch. Stuff that used to be on Amazon Prime is now balkanized right. on, mm -hmm. Disney and Discover right. and yeah, so I, I probably really have 10 subscriptions if I well, that, really the, sat so down. So the lasting legacy yeah. of the pandemic. Yes. We each have 15 subscriptions that cost us like 12 bucks a month in like 25 years. We're gonna be like, yeah, the pandemic ended up costing us about $50,000 in forgotten subscriptions. <laughs> but I, right. I wanna head on something you said actually, it's really interesting is, is the multiple expansion piece because we are now starting to see some very large companies write down. And it doesn't appear like that is actually yet down rounds or down round IPOs. The IPO market appears to be largely shut for these companies. So you're talking privates. Ladies. Private you're companies. Talking like SoftBank has to write down some of their well, private soft, investments. Uh, SoftBank, SoftBank. Uh, SoftBank. Uh, that's, that's, that's its okay. own special, special yeah, they've, case. They've been setting money on fire, yes. you know, behind the curtain for, yes. you know, yeah. over a decade. Mostly Saudi money, so it is what it is. But is um, okay. you're just pointing out generally in the private market value, have come down.
down quite Valuations a bit. Valuations have come year. down, but the, the other question for me is the multiple expansion piece has mm -hmm. been huge. So if yes. you know, six, seven years ago you were making investments, what at the time I was probably sitting there being like, oh, it's astronomical. How can you pay eight times revenue for anything? And lo and behold, you can exit at 30 times revenue. Yes, you have growth there. Yes, you have a structural tailwind, but that multiple piece has massively magnified that. Yes. Versus now you have private companies that raised at 20 times or 30 times revenue. And what you can see in public markets is the multiple is compressing. So even if you grow and you might be structurally profitable at the end, we don't know. But if that multiple contraction continues in the way that it looks like it started about 12 months ago, that makes the landscape very, very difficult for these businesses, both from an exiting standpoint and a continued fundraising standpoint. So how do you see things playing out for businesses with less of a tailwind? Yeah. And, and just a corollary question. If you take yourself back to 2004, 2005, and think about how the markets in the world look to you then, how would you see it playing out? I completely agree with your point that one of the things that just stuns me is I did an analysis at least 10, maybe 15 years ago, and I looked at companies trading north of 10 times revenue that had at least a billion dollar market cap and had some revenue, um, you know, because there were some, you know, uh, revenue with startups, or, yeah. a biotech or something like uh, Wynn Casinos in Macau, mm -hmm. which everyone knew that was going to be a grand slam and they were, they had a $5 billion market cap with zero revenue, mm -hmm. but you, it, but that was different, right? So I, I looked at sort of real businesses and, and I tried to find, was there any um, situation in stock market history of a company trading at 10 times revenue actually doing well as a stock? And I think I found one out of a few hundred, and that one was like Microsoft after they IPO'd. You know, they traded at 10 times revenue for a while, and they grew into that, right? And Microsoft turned out to be a home run from that point. But in almost every other case, it was a disaster. So I just, that was one of my litmus tests. And then now it's like, I, 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 it's like uh, hundreds of companies. Um, and, and they went from 10 times revenue, I take a Shopify, um, a great business, love the business. We recommend it in one of our newsletters, um, you know, after the stock pulled back some, but it's pulled back an awful lot more because the revenue multiple is trading at like 40 times revenue a year ago. Now they've grown their revenue and the stock's down by more than half. And so they're trading at 10 times revenue today. And here's the thing. I mean, I, one of the things as I've grown older and just more experienced in all is, is I no longer cling to this 10 times revenue is ipso facto, um, overvalued, uh, and I would never touch a stock. I actually forced to go long or short. I go long Shopify at this point. I mean, it's a great business, still growing like a weed. Uh, customers love it. Um, and you know what? For a business, that one of the things I just didn't appreciate in my early, you know, I, maybe I trained too much under Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, where they just said, ah, technology and this high growth stuff, you know, we just never look at it. So I was like, okay, I'll never look at it. And the reality is, is if a business can grow its earnings from a dollar a share to five dollars a share over five years, if they can just grow 20, 30 percent a year, um, um, it almost doesn't matter. You can pay, you can pay 10 times revenue, uh, and, and I guarantee you pay 10 times revenue for a business earning a dollar a share, and five years later it's earning five dollars a share, that stock is going to go up. I don't know if it's going to go up 3x, 5x, or 10x, but it's going to go up. Right? And that's a good lesson on the short side. You do not want to be short growth stories like that, right? So, you know, it, obviously in hindsight, look, Netflix has been cut in half um, in the past year or so as all of these competitors have emerged. But uh, Jim Chanos, I recall, was publicly short Netflix, a 30 bagger, a 50 bagger ago. He said there, it, once they reach 30 million subscribers, that's what HBO has, that's the maximum. That's their cap, that's their t TAM. If I were running money right now, Berkshire would still be one of my bigger positions, right? But I would find room in my portfolio to probably, I would actually today, let me go so far as to say today, if I had fresh capital to put to work, I would buy a beaten down Facebook or a Twitter or a beaten down Shopify before I put new money into Berkshire today. So when you talk about fresh capital, mm -hmm. I think that's interesting. One of the things in investing that is so, so difficult is, is the recency bias. And on the short side, the, the pain is just, it's, it's very, very tangible and real. Yes, theoretically, a stock can go to 
Infinity, they tend not to, but just waking up in the morning and seeing a stock that you're short up 20, and then it kind of starts to climb, and you think like, ah, oh, you're getting squeezed, and you hear the borrowers being recalled. How have you found, from a clarity of thought perspective, being involved in newsletter writing, which mm -hmm. is more objective largely than running a book of shorts, or even on the long side? Yeah, um, I'm a much better investor now that I'm not running other people's money than I, than I was when I had a hedge fund. And I, it's only from stopping after 18 years of running my own hedge fund that I fully appreciated how much pressure I put on myself and how it caused me, even though I, I can't blame my investors. I had great investors. I preached the gospel of long-term investing and all, but and most of the time, I followed that. But see, here's the problem is, is if you want to own Netflix over eight years and make 50 times your money, all it requires is one dumb day in years two or three or something to be like, ah, you know, I don't want to be a pig uh, here. I've already made five times my money. You know, it's time to exit. And you leave a 10-bagger on the table, right? That's why, you know, when I look back at what my portfolio, I had 12 longs, 12 shorts, you know, 70 long by 15 short. The, the short positions were much smaller. When I relaunched, um, it just, it, kills me to know that it was not my stock picking but my portfolio management, bad portfolio management where I effectively, I pulled my flowers and I watered my weeds. And of course you want to do the opposite in investing. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, so it underscored for, for me how I never used to fully appreciate the portfolio management, how, how you size things, whether you, you have the discipline and, and to let your winners run. Um, uh, those kinds of decisions are as important, sometimes more important, than whether you're a good stock picker. You need to be a good stock picker, but bad portfolio management will undo the fruits of good stock picking, and that's what I did. Um, so now that I'm no longer running money, and um, I'm, um, I'm a better portfolio manager too, because I don't feel as much pain when some of our stocks go down, and over the past year, you know, a bunch of our stocks have gone down, I don't know how to square that, though. I would like to think that if I, if I ever got back into running a fund, that, you know, okay, now I've learned these lessons from a few year period of not running other people's money and I can take this fresh, new, experienced mindset. But you know what, I'm not, I'm not convinced I could because there's just, the, there's just inherent pressure um, the, of, of managing other people's money. And that can cause anyone, it certainly caused me to, uh, react in ways that were suboptimal in terms of generating good long-term returns, um, uh, particularly on the portfolio management side. Obviously, everything reaches a point at which it should be sold, right? long enough time horizon. I mean, in, in our lifetimes, could we have ever, if you rewound a few years or several years, could you have ever imagined that GE would become hollowed out yes. and be really on the rope. Sure. Or Could let's have. say you caught the Valiant 10 bagger on the way up and then mm -hmm. it went down by 98%. Right. So, I mean, so how that's, do you know? How that's, do you know that's, with that's Netflix? How do, and... how do you know when, uh, you know, when a company has fundamentally, I mean, there could be such extreme overvaluation. So, Shopify, the business has done fine. Stock's down, I don't know, 60, 70% from its peak in the past year just because it was trading at 40 times revenue, right? Um, but more commonly, you need to get out when a story fundamentally changes. Um, I guess, I mean, compare GE to Berkshire Hathaway. Like, both were, you know, go back 20 years. Both were run by legendary octogenarians, had delivered great returns for their shareholders over time. But one, you could safely hold on to and have done well, and the other, you'd, you'd be down 80% on your money during a bull market in a, you know, over the past 20 years. Uh, how do you know? I mean, I would. I, I followed both companies closely, Berkshire religiously, but you know, GE I never owned, but looked at. One company, the you could you knew GE. I mean, it was obvious that they were using GE capital to mm -hmm. to uh, play the earnings game and f uh, find at the you know the last few days of a quarter there'd always mm -hmm. be some acquisition or asset sale to make their number. Berkshire Hathaway is drowning in tens of billions of cash now 150 billion almost today, but back then tens of billions of cash. The uh, GE was loaded to the gills with the maximum amount of debt possible, right? Um, so 
I, I would argue that a rational, reasonable person could have figured out that, you know, Berkshire, all of the th drivers of its enormous success from, you know, the 1960s into the 1990s and 2000s were all still intact. Most importantly, Buffett and Munger still running it in the same way they always have run it very conservatively and so forth. And you could see GE was just playing games and was risky and had lots of debt. And that's one of the reasons, thankfully, that I always, as GE got cut in half, a lot of people thought it was cheap at that point. Um, the activists, um, try em. Try em, um, mm -hmm. and, and really credible activists, mm -hmm. Nelson Peltz and all, um, got involved. And again, I looked at it, and that was like at 30 bucks. And I actually now recall very briefly in my hedge fund, I owned it for a little bit. You know, they laid out a very compelling slide presentation. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? This company is still, the cash flows don't add up. If you look at their cash flow statement, it did not match their reported income. And that's always a big warning flag. Mm -hmm. Layer on a ton of debt. And I was like, you know what? I'm out of here. This, this thing just makes me nervous. Masa-san has talked about building SoftBank for the next thousand years. I question whether Netflix can, the stock can thrive beyond the age of QE, but uh, that remains to be seen. Thank you very much, Whitney. It's been great having you here for the short of it. And, My pleasure, uh, thank you. Yeah, and Freddie, thank you as well. Thanks, guys.